you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2 as we look at verses 4 through 10 once again. 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 10. I invite you to follow along as I read those. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day. By their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. As we begin to focus our thoughts this morning. We have been saying that God knows proper judgment. God knows proper judgment. We ask the question, what goes into that? And in part, we answer, our Lord has all knowledge. That is, it is comprehensive, it is quantitative, and qualitative. It is quantitative. He far outstrips the amount of things we know, and he knows them all, and he knows them all equally. And in fact, I would suggest they are what they are because he knows them to be that way, and that gets us into qualitative knowledge. It is creative. He speaks, and it comes into being. And the last time I checked, no human being could say, come into being out of nothing and whatever they're thinking of comes into being. It just doesn't happen. He has all knowledge. He has all knowledge. And because of that, because of not just the vastness of of his knowledge, but the qualitative nature of his knowledge, he knows the ways of all people. He knows his creatures. He knows our propensities, our desires, and so forth. He knows all about us. He knows the very heart. He knows the very heart. And because of that, he knows the motives of people's hearts. He knows the purity of your thinking, the purity of your heart and motive, or the impurity of it. And, beloved, quite frankly, I am sure that it is very mixed more often than not, in terms of our motives, but the Lord knows it all. The Lord knows it all. And in fact, as Paul said in another place, 1 Corinthians 4, he said, even though he doesn't know anything against himself, yet by this he is not acquitted, because the Lord will judge the motives of every person's heart. And he knows it. And so he knows the motives. He knows how decisions were arrived at and what would have to be different for other decisions to be made. In fact, Jesus says as much when he says that if the miracles were done in such and such a place, they would have repented long ago. But instead... You are not repenting. You're not even better than them. He knows the conditions. He knows it all 
of how a decision is made and how it is arrived at. Beloved, there is nothing that can escape his knowledge and gaze. And there is no pulling the proverbial wool over his eyes. We tend to like to fool each other, don't we? We tend to put the best foot forward, so to speak, don't we? But that doesn't fool the Lord. He knows it all. And we will be and are exposed to him in full measure. Simply put, he knows all things. The bottom line, he knows all things. God knows proper judgment, therefore. So when we ask the question, does God know how to deal with the unrighteous? Does God know what they're up to? Does God know everything about them? And of course he does. We answer in complete confidence, yes, he does. Yes, he does. He knows how to deal with the unrighteous. He demonstrates this in redemptive history we have found in terms of angels, the angels who sinned, and in terms of the ancient world, as Peter put it, and in terms of Sodom and Gomorrah. Three categories of, of beings in the ancient world, pre-flood, and uh, angels, and localized in terms of Sodom and Gomorrah. He knows it. He is able to do all his holy will. He is able to hold the unrighteous accountable. The Lord does not have to write anything down. Right? Doesn't have to take notes. Doesn't have to write it down. He never forgets anything. Not a thing. He knows it all. Now we have asked another question. Let me back up. I don't rarely, I rarely do that. I want to back up. And let me just say this. No creature can stop him. Okay? There is no scheme of unrighteousness that can thwart God or overcome him in any way. There are people that seem also to get away with almost anything. And you might point to somebody and say, well, it seems like so-and-so just gets away with everything. And you point to yourself and you say, if I had done that, I would never have gotten away with it, right? Maybe you haven't said that. I've said that. I hear it said. But the point of the matter is, no one gets away with any, anything because of the knowledge of the Lord. In fact, Paul goes so far as to say they are without excuse because he makes it evident to them. They have no defense. They have no apologetic. There is no single unbeliever or unrighteous person that will stand in the day of judgment before him and say, I never even knew you existed. And if I had known that, I would have turned. God makes himself evident to all. We do our best to suppress it and deny it. And that's the problem we have. Now we have asked another question. We asked, does God know how to protect his people? We have admitted we have admitted that sometimes this looks disjointed and arbitrary in terms of thinking about God protecting his people. It does not always seem that way. And sometimes it looks like God does not protect his people. The righteous these days very often die right along with the unrighteous. Think of a tornado, think of 
a hurricane, think of an earthquake, other natural disaster, fire, whatever it might be. And sometimes it looks like the unrighteous are having their way. However, with the introduction of Noah, we find that this is not the case. God is able, beloved, God is able to hold the unrighteous accountable while preserving his people. So we ask the question again and continue with this thought. Does God know how to protect his people? And Peter introduces us to the case of Lot. Now with Lot, we have a little bit of a different account. For Noah was involved in a worldwide event. And Lot was involved in a localized event. With Noah, God was concerned about worldwide wickedness. And with Lot, God was concerned about localized wickedness. Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them. However, it is still wickedness and how to hold one to judgment and the other in salvation. Right? There's wickedness. There are the wicked. However, among that group, there may be a subgroup called the righteous. Can he hold one to judgment while holding the other in salvation? So let's pick it up in the scriptures to see what Peter says concerning Lot in 2 Peter 7 and 8. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Peter does not mention how it is that Lot ended up in Sodom itself. And so if you remember the account from Genesis chapter 13, verse 7, there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, Abram took it upon himself to allow Lot Lot to choose which part of the land he would claim as his share for his own flocks, his own servants. He said, lift up your eyes, look. If you go to the north, I'll go south. You go east, I'll go west. And we'll separate and we want to be at peace. And you may be aware of the rest of the story that Lot, it is said, looked around and found the choicest part of the land which was found in the Jordan Valley. And he moved himself and his flocks and his servants to that area which is described as the Garden of the Lord. And Lot eventually settles near Sodom and apparently later moves into the city of Sodom itself. And later, it appears, he actually becomes a prominent member of the community as a leader. He is sitting at the gate where the leaders sit to conduct business. When you read this story of Lot in isolation from the rest of redemptive history, it is easy to understand how you may reach a different conclusion than Peter did when he called Lot righteous. Nevertheless, Peter calls Lot righteous. That righteous soul was tormented. He was oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men. And at the same time, his soul was tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. From this, we understand that Lot had chosen to live a righteous life while living in the middle of an unrighteous community. He is among the righteous of whom Abram interceded before the Lord. 
Think of, think of the peer pressure that Lot was under as we kind of use a modern phrase, peer pressure. A constant barrage. We're not told why he stayed. We're not told what went into his thinking about maybe why he didn't move or anything else. But there he was. Abraham interceded so that the Lord would stay his hand of judgment if he found, at minimum, ten righteous persons living there. If he would find ten righteous persons. Now remember, he started, I believe it was, with fifty. With fifty, and he worked his way down. He worked his way down to ten. And it might seem like, well, surely there's at least ten. So although we might question the motive of Lot in choosing this particular land and maybe even call into question his loyalty to God in doing so, in terms of the scriptures, he is to be numbered among the righteous. And the point of the matter for Peter is that the Lord rescued righteous Lot. As the Lord had done previously concerning Noah and preserving him and his family, so the Lord turned his attention to Sodom and Gomorrah in judgment, all the while knowing how to rescue the righteous. The Lord heard Abram. And his intercession. And he brought Lot and his wife and two of his daughters safely out of Sodom. However, unfortunately, Lot's wife failed to heed the warning given to her and looked back and was turned into a pillar of salt. And at this point, it's something I was maybe even going to leave out, but just some thoughts that I had about it in terms of our relationship with the Lord. And I decided to keep it. I wanted you to note something I don't want us to forget. It is important to understand God's name as it is involved in the rescue of Lot. It is important to understand both God's knowledge and his name, his character. Okay? Okay? It is not just about Lot. It is not just about God's knowledge. It is about his character and how he acts, his own motivations. We read back in Genesis 19, verse 16, uh, that Lot hesitated, but he hesitated. So the man seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters for the compassion of the Lord was upon him. And they brought him out and put him outside the city. And so here we see the name of God as it is applied to Lot in his rescue. For compassion is God's name as much as any other aspect of his name. And it is according to his name that God acts on behalf of his people. Remember the encounter in Exodus 34, Moses with the Lord God as the Lord proclaimed his name. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in loving kindness and truth and so forth. Compassionate. Beloved, in your situation, for we were all dead in sins and trespasses, right? That's what the Bible says. The Lord doesn't just look at us and say, oh, these poor slobs. What does he do? These are my creatures, and I love them. And he sets his love on us. He is compassionate toward us and drawing us to himself, beloved. Drawing you specifically 
to himself. Beloved, we were rebellious in our hearts, turning away from the way of the Lord, turning away from embracing his name and everything that it stood for, but the Lord had compassion upon you. You were in a very similar situation in terms of your own standing uh, with the ancient world and the wicked of Sodom and Gomorrah. But like Lot, he put his compassion on you and in a sense grabbed you by the hand and drug you out of your condition. He rescued you. Remember that always. Remember his name. That's all fine and dandy, isn't it? Looking back at ancient times, it's all fine and good for back then and for those people who lived way back then. And the question arises, does God know what to do today? Right? Okay, we have angels, we have the ancient world, we have Sodom and Gomorrah. But pastor, we are pointing way back. Does God know what to do today? Does God still know how to deal with the unrighteous and to protect the righteous today? And we admit that it's a question that sometimes weighs heavily upon our hearts. It's a question that weighs heavily upon our hearts because we see suffering, the suffering of little babies. We see suffering of the elderly we see suffering of our own age groups around the world. And it weighs heavy. It weighs heavy upon our hearts. You see, we observe so-called acts of God through natural disasters, tornado, hurricane, fire, whatever, whatever, in which death comes upon all kinds of people, whether Christian or non-Christian, indiscriminately. At least we perceive it as being indiscriminate and arbitrary. That is often an argument the unbeliever, especially the new atheist, will use against the Christian will use against you. Well, look at this. He does not discern between the righteous and the unrighteous. They both succumb to fire and earthquake and tornado and so on and so on. And they have a view of God that grows out of that. But you see, their view starts with the event and works back Whereas we start with God himself and work our way out. And there's a huge difference in that. Now, we know whatever, that whatever Peter is saying, he's not saying that believers don't fall under the same acts of judgment. That is, earth, things where death takes place. That's an ex acts of judgment, right? Because the wages of sin is death. Okay? So we can call it an act of judgment. Look at Luke 13 in that regard. The point isn't, are some more wicked than others? No, but we are all sinners. But we also must face our Lord. Unless you repent, you likewise will perish, Jesus said. It points up some very important things for us. So Peter is not saying that believers and unbelievers don't fall into the same kinds of things, that is, the same acts of judgment in this world today.
The key for us is whether or not God knows how to hold the unrighteous under judgment and preserve the righteous through judgment. Was Jesus judged? You're hesitant. Yes, he was. He was judged on the cross. He was judged on the cross on our behalf. But was he dealt the same way with the unrighteous? No. His was the final sacrifice. And through judgment, Jesus then beheld the glory of God. He understood that, despising the shame of the cross. And he looked ahead, Hebrews says. I don't want to die. I don't embrace the thought of the judgment of death, that last enemy taking my life, so to speak. Is God able, you see, to preserve me? That's the key. Is he able to deal with the unrighteous and the righteous differently? Is he able to preserve the righteous through judgment, even though we taste that last enemy, death? So it would do well for us to get the text in front of us again to see what Peter says here. We find at the very beginning of our text for today, in verse 4, it starts, For if God did not spare... And then in verse 5, and did not spare the ancient world, you can hear that. And if he did not spare the ancient world. And then again in verse 6, and if he condemned. These kinds of statements are contrasted within the text with two key phrases. But preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness... And then down in verse 7 he says, And if he rescued righteous Lot. For if he did not spare angels, verse 4. If he did not spare the ancient world, verse 5. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, verse 6. Verse 5, B, but preserve Noah. And verse 7, and if he rescued righteous Lot, see he's building. You can see from these statements that Peter is doing an if this then this type of argument. In which he is bringing us to a proper conclusion in the matter before us. And zeroing in on exactly what he is getting at. It is important then to remember the context of the church in which Peter writes his letter. The church is under persecution and suffering trouble. And it is of such a nature where it seems like the church may have been forgotten. Maybe there were those in the church that has God forgotten us. And the unrighteous seem to prosper. What are we to hold fast to in a situation in which it seems the unrighteous are not dealt with and the righteous are not being preserved? Let's look at Peter's conclusion. If, 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 but he preserved Noah, he rescued Lot, 9 and 10, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from natural disasters. No, that's not what he says. From automobile accidents? No, that's not what he says either. From terrible diseases, even disfiguring diseases or accidents? No, that's not what he's saying. What does he say? He knows how to rescue the godly from temptation or periods of testing, if you will. And to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. That is the false teachers.
Now, look in your text. This is kind of extra credit. Look in your text at verse 3. We had just talked about false teachers there, right? And he says, And in their greed, that is, in the false teachers' greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. How do we know this? For if God did not spare angels, if God did not spare the ancient world, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah while preserving Noah and rescuing righteous Lot, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. You see how that fits together now as we've gone through it? Don't we, we must be careful when we are dealing with those who oppose the faith not to try and give an answer the Lord does not give. He doesn't promise to keep us from earthquakes or tornadoes or hurricanes or other kinds of things, but he does promise to help us through with those things that are periods of testing. And earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes can be and are a period of testing, are they not? Do they not shake you to your core? I mean, when we were in that, they call it an a inland hurricane, hurricane force winds blowing through and the rain and everything blowing through the state of Iowa when we were down there just not that long ago. And literally, the building shook. And we watched parts of the roof flying off and landing in front of us out the window. We weren't guaranteed the building wouldn't collapse. We weren't guaranteed that something terrible, might, something more terrible might happen. And when you went out and about and you saw the semis tipped over and crops just flattened and silos flattened and other things flattened and you realize this was serious. Rescue us from temptation. It's very important for us. These words from the hand of the Apostle Peter should be very encouraging to us then. Although it is true God does not send worldwide floods today, and he doesn't rain brimstone and fire upon particular cities, that is, it's not announced to us, It is true that these very acts of God in history establish a paradigm for us to rely upon as to how God will act and how God does act even now. So as we close out our time together, that all-important question, does God know how to protect his people? We have seen that he does know how to protect his people through the events of the flood and the preservation of Noah. We have seen that he does through the judgment against Sodom and Gomorrah and the preservation of Lot and his daughters. And some may still say, well, that's all fine and good for then, but what about now? And that question spurred us on to ask the next question. Does God know what to do today? And the next time I'm here with you or on video or whatever, we will deal with the rest of that question. And at first glance, we admit that it doesn't appear that believers are being delivered from their own floods or Sodom and Gomorrah, but are rather carried off with the unrighteous. However, we have begun to see that that misses the point. There isn't going to be another worldwide flood and there isn't going to be another Sodom and Gomorrah, but there will always be times of temptation and testing. 
And of course, there will be death, and ultimately there will be a final judgment at the end of days. The church in Peter's day was suffering persecution, and they needed to know that God had them in their hands. Right? That's the best place to be, is in his hands. No matter what the world is doing, or whatever is swirling around, around us. We need to know that we are in the palm of his hand. They needed to know that the unrighteous did not have the upper hand no matter what their circumstances seemed to dictate. And thus God knows what to do today. And we conclude next time, Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. Father, thank you for your word to us and for helping us to sort through this kind of thing. Because it is difficult and it does weigh heavy upon our hearts and the, the, the unbeliever, the new atheist, seeks to exploit these kinds of things and they seek to denigrate the name of God. So, Lord, let us take these words to heart and understand the fuller context and what Peter is seeking to communicate. May it be, Lord, that, that we will stand firm in the faith, not moved from our foundation that was built so eloquently by Peter in the, in the first chapter of Second Peter, but rather that we would stand firm in the faith knowing that he knows how to rescue us from periods of testing, holding the unrighteous under punishment while rescuing the righteous. And we'll give you the glory and the praise through Christ our Lord. Amen.